important topic. And we really uh, needed a moment to talk about it and to have discussion about this topic. So we are 7 p.m. right now, and we're not going to be late for our beginning. So I want to thank, uh, first of all, Anne Patridge for her participants here today with us to talk about uh, a very important topic um, we have in Brazil uh, by the data from Amazon 3, we have almost 17% of our women diagnosed before 40 years old. So we really have a great number of young women in Brazil being diagnosed with breast cancer. And we really uh, need to look differently to these women because they have different particularities, some things that need to be take care uh, differently. So I wanna thank you, Anne, to bring all your knowledge from years of research. And I also wanna thank Daniela Sadi. She's been part of this. And this is a great topic for her too. We have been studying and trying to gather a, a group of survivorship here in Brazil. And as you know, so Daniela is, is also very interested in this topic. And I wanna, I also thank Pedro Exman and Ana Amelia. They are both a clinical oncologist. Pedro, you know very well, and he's in Sao Paulo in Osvaldo Cruz. Ana Amelia is a clinical oncologist here in Salvador Bahia from mm -hmm. Regido. And Dani, sorry, she's a clinical oncologist in Brasilia. Hello. So we have different parts of Brazil being part of this webinar. And, and that's it. So after your talk, we will have some discussion and then the opportunity to, to uh, go further in some topics in young breast cancer patients. So Anne, please. Great, I'm gonna um, share my screen. Let me just get it. And you'll have to tell me if it's okay, hang on. Let me get it to the, the you know, the classic right view. Is that the right view or should I swap it? Swap it, right? Yes. Okay. How's that? Is that good? Yeah. Yes, okay. it's great. Okay. Um, and it is not supposed to start right there. So we don't pay attention for a second. Everybody close their eyes for one second. Because I don't <laughs> want to do. Just close your eyes, close your eyes, close your eyes. <laughs> screw it up. Hang on. Okay. Now you got a preview. All right. All right. Now I'll start. So, <clears throat> excuse me. It's, thanks so much for having me. My favorite topic and uh, one of my favorite countries to speak in, especially when I'm physically there. So next time, let's make a plan and I'll come to you in Sao Paulo, please. It's much nicer there. It was cold up here today. So I, I, it's warm there, right? Um, so we'll talk about breast cancer in young women and specifically what do we know about differences and how we might uh, capitalize on them to improve how young women do. And one of the most striking things we've known for a long time is that young women um, seem to have a worse outcome overall compared to even not so old young women. Uh, these are from the 80s data um, where there was a 13% uh, relative survival difference between women diagnosed between 30 and 34 and women 45 and 49. Um, the hazards were worse for the very young, which doesn't really make sense in terms of survival unless their disease is much worse because you know they're not dying of anything else. Fast forward, um, this unfortunately is still true. Uh, you can see here in data that we published this past year um, that young women continue to have higher risk of recurrence and mortality from breast cancer. These are from the US SEER data um, and it's not as bad. There's a 5% difference. And you can see here now they're compared less than 40 um, compared to old 40 to 60, 61 to 75 and over 75. And you can see young women are doing as poorly as women over 75 in terms of their um, breast cancer uh, death rate. And, you know, the, obviously we don't want older women to die either, but they're definitely not dying young by definition. That's number one. And number two, um, this may also have something to do with people saying kind of no thank you. And also some of the access issues that it's due to it, that young women are experiencing. Um, we'll talk more about that. 
Um, so it's still a problem. And what we also know, and anybody who takes care of these folks knows, is that young age is associated with worse quality of life. Uh, the nurses' health study, which is you know 122 plus thousand women, uh, had over a thousand women with breast cancer. I mean, they looked at the young women compared to healthy young women, and they looked at the older women compared to healthy older women. It was the youngest women who developed breast cancer who had the largest relative declines in body role, body uh, physical roles, bodily pain, social functioning, and mental health. Um, and in their study. Um, that Patty Gans did even six years out from diagnosis, inclusive of 42 women under 35 and 93 women under 40 or 35 to 40. While they're very healthy in terms of their physical functioning, they're having the hardest time with social and emotional functioning and the vitality was ironically the lowest in the youngest women. Uh, one clue to what might be going on for these young women's women is that they have more depressive symptoms, more negative affect, and they have lower mental health, particularly if they've gone through a menopausal transition with treatment, uh, which has, of course, implications for all the things we're doing these days for treatment for patients. Um, so I would argue that breast cancer can be difficult for a person of any age, um, but as you can see here, it's harder for our youngest patients who have to deal with not only decisions around chemo, endocrine, local therapy, which may be compounded by their young age, but also concerns about fertility, premature menopause, higher risk of having genetic predisposition, and then the impact that all of this has on role functioning, sexual health, body image, and the psychosocial functioning. So it's very hard for young women, um, even more so generally than older women. Um, and it results in all of these things result in young patients have being a disparate population. And then of course, within the young age groups, there are even more disparities um, in the United States, um, pretty deep racial ethnic disparities as well. You can see here a graphic that Rachel Friedman put together a few years ago now trying to kind of pick apart the what, how do you think about a disparate population in order to get at the problems and understand the differences so you can attack them. And when we think about young women in particular, you can think there are medical and physical host differences and competing risks. Young women don't tend to have the competing risks, but they certainly have different host differences. There are disease extent, young women are not screened generally, and so they have bigger tumors. There are biological differences, certainly in the tumor subtypes young women develop, and we'll talk more about that. And then one big bucket is the access and uptake of care and adherence in the treatment differences uh, that we'll also talk about that we can try to use to make the situation better. Um, now, a few years ago, about 20 years ago almost, we started a prospective cohort focused on our young women. As you heard, I do research in this area. And the reason is there weren't enough young women in any given trial. And so we'll talk about some studies today, but, but in general, there are not enough women under 40 or certainly not under 35 to be able to say enough about these subgroups. Even when you include all premenopausal women, uh, maybe that's not true in, in Brazil, if you guys have 17% of the population, but certainly historically, of breast cancer patients, the youngest patients seem to make up only about six or 7% of the population. Um, so you guys should collect these cohorts because you'll be able to tell, tell us more <laughs> about how to care for these women. Um, but we started a cohort to follow women and dedicated just towards these young women. And we uh, are looking at disease and tumor biology and molecular characteristics as well as treatment issues. And then the all important psychosocial and behavioral issues. We accrued over 1300 women and I'll show you some uh, data from there. And we also collected blood and tumor and we do medical record review. And so we're learning a lot from these women over time. Um, one of the first things we learned though, was that um, young women, uh, if you looked at very young women, less than 30 versus women 31 to 35 versus women 36 to 40, there weren't big differences in what their disease presented like. We've looked at this now in the full cohort. These are the first data from uh, just a proportion of the cohort. The only difference across age groups was that there was more tumor necrosis in the youngest women, but nothing else um, stood out by the very young versus the not so very young versus the still young, but not so young. Um, what we did see though, was that most young women, despite having more ER negatives, most of them still have ER positive breast cancer. Uh, there did appear to be a higher prevalence of HER2 positive disease in our youngest patients, um, up from uh, you know, 27 to 43%. And nearly two thirds of young patients when they presented um, have high grade disease. So very different than what you'd see in a, an older group. 
Now, this has actually played out in a large um, population-based data set, which was quite gratifying, where they showed very similar findings in the California Cancer Registry, and HER2 positivity is indeed uh, more likely in our youngest patients, triple negative we knew was more likely, particularly in young African-American women. And then when they've looked at it, um, there are more luminal B type tumors than luminal A and, and more basal-like in our youngest women. So the biology of the disease, it's a different mix of tumors for sure. Um, we recently looked at this in the young women's cohort with the fully amassed cohort of over 1,136 women because their tumors had undergone central pathology review. And you can see here similar um, breakdowns as I just presented. Um, and what we did was we looked at it within BRCA1 and BRCA2 tested patients and, and tested patients who were negative. So you can see here that as you would expect in a BRCA1 population, uh, and I believe this was, doesn't have the number here, but I think this was about, there were 150 mutation carriers altogether. I think the majority were BRCA1 actually. And then I think it was like seven, 80 and, and 50 or something like that, 90 and 50. And the bottom line is that as you would expect more triple negatives in the BRCA1 and more of a mix in the BRCA2, but I think what's most interesting is when you remove those who have BRCA1 and BRCA2 mutations, what do you get? And what you get is a large population with luminal A-like tumors. So low to intermediate grade hormone receptor positive. Uh, so it's just, you know, the distribution of molecular phenotypes varies both by age and whether or not someone has a genetic predisposition to the disease, which I think is super interesting and will have implications for who we test later and how we target uh, these tumors later, how we think about second primaries in these patients, where we've historically quoted people as having a high risk of having a second primary if they have a genetic, I mean, if they, excuse me, if they have a triple negative, but what if we know they're not a BRCA1 carrier or a BRCA2 carrier? Do they have that same risk? I don't think so. Um, and so uh, we've done more work looking within tumor subtypes at prognosis, and these are the same data now broken up by uh, tumor subtype. And you can see here that um, in that SEER data analysis, that when you look at patients with the hormone receptor positive lower grade, those luminal A-likes, the youngest, the red is doing as poorly as the older ladies. But if you look at the luminal Bs, the HER2 positives, and it's maybe the triple negatives, the youngest ones are still doing a little bit worse. I'm not sure what's going on there, but there's still something going on. But the biggest delta is actually in the hormone receptor positive, lower grade tumors where you see the biggest age effect, which I don't think is what people would have expected, but that's what we see. And we've seen that in other data sets as well. You can see here, this is fleshed out in terms of, so that was an unadjusted analysis. But if you look here, you can see when we adjusted for race, ethnicity, insurance, SEER registry, stage of diagnosis, subtype, and treatment, the only group where age, young age was prognostic was in the luminal A-like, those that hormone receptor positive and, and lower grade, grade one or two. It was not prognostic independently in the luminal B types, in the HER2 type, and in the triple negatives, which is really interesting and suggests that yes, we need to treat towards the tumor and age alone, except maybe in those luminal A should not be a factor or as much of a factor. Um, we've shown this now a number of times in our HER2 uh, study. So I looked at the, this in the NCCN database and it showed a very similar thing when you controlled for all of the factors like treatment and size of tumor and stage, HER2 positive breast cancer, age was not a predictor of outcome. Uh, we looked in the HERA analysis as well in the trial and the SEP analysis. Um, age also was not a predictor of at least early recurrence. And then most recently I've looked with Matteo Lambertino um, in uh, Italy at the Affinity trial. And that also showed similar findings that age was not a prognostic factor when you controlled for the other things we know about people's cancer. So what I think all this suggests is that at least with HER2 positive breast cancer, our treatment principles, whether it's escalation or de-escalation, which we're doing increasingly for smaller HER2 positive breast cancers, they should be similar. And we shouldn't spare young women um, uh, the opportunity to participate in these studies or avail themselves of these uh, better therapies or you know, ev evolutions in our thinking around therapy. 
And let's just get back to the luminal A. These are data from the NCCN, which as I showed earlier in the SEER data, the worst in terms of uh, age being the most prognostic was for luminal A, which we conventionally think of as the wimpiest of breast cancers. And yet the biggest um, distance between ages was shown the youngest women did the worst in the luminal A. It was an independent predictor as opposed to the others. So something's definitely going on there. Can we figure it out? Um, we've looked at also whether or not in the genetics of young women, whether or not there are big differences in the germline alterations. Um, and we did whole exome sequencing in our young women's cohort on the youngest 35, oh, excuse me, those younger than 35, the first 100, we actually did it in 92 because the other eight failed. And we compared that to TCGA, the under 35 crowd, as well as to the over 35 crowd in the Cancer Genome Atlas. And what we found was that amongst both our young women as well as the young women in the TCGA, um, if you expanded to other germline mutations beyond BRCA1 and 2, you found a total of about 25% of patients had a germline mutation. Now, in our cohort, it was 14% had a BRCA1 or BRCA2. In TCGA, it was about 17%. And then about 10% of other genetic abnormalities, you can see here in both groups, um, and that's in contrast to the TCGA over 45, where it's about 8% any pathologic abnormality. And there it's um, 3% had BRCA1 or 2, and about 6% had the other germline um, mutations that we typically test for. Again, this is whole exome, so we can look for more things. Um, but it's, I think this is really important when you think about the expanded panel testing and who to do it on, who may benefit, and how we might ultimately um, target these. Um, we also have looked at the genomics of the tumor in our youngest versus older patients in the TCGA, and we found no statistically significant, significant difference in luminal A tumor, excuse me, luminal B tumors, HER2 positive tumors, or triple negative, but we did in those luminal A's again. So maybe something's going on biologically. Maybe a luminal A tumor in a young person is difference. Our young women had more GATA3 and ARID D1A mutations and fewer pic 3 ca mutations than the older women. All of these things confer a more poor prognosis in luminal A-like breast cancer. And so that could speak to, it's not just they have bigger tumors than our older women, but they have more aggressive, even luminal A-type tumors than older women. And that may be part of why they seem to do worse. Um, other research is looking at you know, what else could be going on in terms of host biology and making more aggressive tumors or being a nidus or a home for metastases. And um, it is known that mammary involution or being postpartum is a wound healing like remodeling event. And it's been um, shown in animal models that tumor may be promoted in the involutional host. Um, the postpartum state has been associated with an influx of suppressive immune cells and immune signature, signature clustering. And there's also a suggestion that there is weaning induced liver involution that's supportive of metastases and particular metastatic niche in younger patients. And we've been part of uh, studies that have looked at this and it appears that the closer to having had a pregnancy and development of a breast cancer, the more likely if a person develops metastases, they may be more likely to be in the liver or the brain, which is really interesting work and we're obviously working to figure out what's going on there, but it also suggests potential avenues for intervention. You know, if it's a wound healing like event and you could do something to decrease the inflammation or the immune suppression that might go around on around this time, you may be able to do some kind of prevention of breast cancer in the postpartum period. So stay tuned lots of people are scientists are working on that. And right now we actually already capitalize on the very premenopausal state of our youngest patients. That's one of the biggest host differences, right? So anybody under 50 is probably premenopausal, but our youngest patients are under 40 are very premenopausal. And that has implications for whether their ovaries shut down with standard therapies or they're we're heading, to, um, heading to menopause anyway. And this brings us to, um, you know, do we actually need chemotherapy for our youngest patients? Uh, these are the seminal work from the Taylor RX trial. This was the original presentation from ASCO in 2018. I like to show this slide because it shows the error bars, 
Okay, you see the, the uh, not the error bars, but the confidence inter intervals. And you can see here for the less than 50, the confidence intervals were quite wide, but they did start to separate out, um, you know, at around 14, 15. And then you can see in the older than 50 that nobody seemed to get benefit from chemotherapy, but or see how wide these confidence intervals are. And you have to take it with a grain because if you look at women under 40, it was actually the youngest group. There were very few women. It was only about 10% of women were under 40 in, in Taylor X. So it's even difficult to say anything about the youngest population in there. Um, when they did break it down though, and you can see they had 200 women under 40, um, when they looked at whether or not chemo helped, and I think this is one of the most important um, analyses they've done in this study to date, they found that actually chemo did not help the youngest. And it seemed to help the older you were among the postmenopausal premenopausal group, the more likely it was to help. How can one explain that? Well, it's, it's going to send you into menopause the older you are, right? Chemotherapy. And therefore it may be the chemoendocrine effect that's the bulk of the benefit somebody is getting when they get chemotherapy in a premenopause state with a low oncotype, whereas someone under 40 is less likely to go into menopause and lo and behold, they may not get quite as much benefit or any benefit with a low risk oncotype score. So this was really important data, but then along came uh, our expander, which was presented now uh, again in the most recent San Antonio. And in the postmenopausal women with an oncotype less than 50, uh, 25 with one to three positive nodes, there was no clear benefit from chemotherapy. But of course, there was a pretty large benefit, 5%, with chemotherapy in the premenopausal patients. In this study, they didn't have enough very young patients to do the analysis that I just showed you. There are too few women included in the study under the age of 40 um, to really look at that and whether or not the younger ones didn't get as much benefit. Many of us have argued that a lot of this is probably due to ovarian function suppression from the chemotherapy, but and only about 18% of the people on the study got OFS if they were premenopausal. So it remains a very important question that we don't know the answer to. Here you can see the similar analysis um, in terms of the ages and whether chemo added value or not, but look, you know, you don't have young. The, the youngest you have is less than 55. And part of that's because people probably didn't randomize their very young with one to three positive nodes. They probably just gave them chemo until they could prove that it wasn't gonna help the older women, which you can understand because it's the stakes are highest in our young women. So we do need to answer this question and we hope that there will be a study. Here's, here it is again, just showing you, you know, the benefits. You know, chemo was better in the 50 plus, in the um, 40 to 49, in the less than 45, but the numbers were quite small. Um, and so we're kind of left with this. And as I said, there were only a small proportion, 126 who had ovarian function suppression compared to 647, it's at least for at six months. Um, so stay tuned on this. There will be a study. I think NRG is putting together a study in the United States, randomizing to everybody gets ovarian function suppression and then they get chemo or no chemo in the lower risk oncotypes. And we'll hopefully learn. Um, for now, we're left with a difficult situation for our youngest. And this is also true when you look at the MAMA print data and you look at other genomic expression predictors, it's often that there are very few younger women in order to be able to say enough about it, um, but it plays out in similar ways. Our group actually looked at our young women's cohort uh, and we were able to, Phil Corvu looked at um, a large sample of our young moon and they, he showed that Oncotype was prognostic in the N0 and N1 uh, women in the young women's study, as you can see here, very similar as to what you would expect. Obviously the ones with nodal involvement do worse. And then in a non-randomized group where women, some women got chemo and some women, women didn't, uh, with Oncotype's 11 to 25 node negative, there was no difference in how women did with regard to um, event-free survival distant, whether they got chemo or not. Again, it's not randomized, but I think it shows you that we're pretty good at judging who needs chemo and who doesn't. Um, so I'm not sure we always need to get an oncotype, but we do. 
Um, we also know, though, the benefits now of uh, ovarian function suppression in our youngest patients. These are the data from the SOFT trial showing a substantial um, you know, disease-free and now overall survival in the most updated 12 and 13-year data from ovarian function suppression and the addition of exomestine uh, and sometimes tamoxifen is tolerated. But we also know, and we want to do the ovarian function suppression in higher risk patients, but we also know that it's the hardest to take for our youngest patients. You can see here that um, the discontinuation rates are highest in our youngest patients. Here they compared less than 35 to over 35. Remember, this is soft and tech, so they're all they're all fairly young. And the young women are more likely to come off of it, and they're more likely to um, come off their oral endocrine therapy as well. Um, and of course, young women also are more likely to have more symptoms. Depression, as we alluded to, is common, and we think it's even worse uh, with ovarian function suppression. There's a 5% increase with OFS, uh, even though it's better for how people do in the long run. And there were lots of symptoms, um, similar global quality of life, but uh, lots of symptoms. Reassuringly, endocrine differences are less pronounced after two years. And then among women who got chemo because that hopefully they needed it, the endocrine toxicity uh, change was less because you know it was, it was easier than chemo. Um, we've known for many years now that younger women are more likely to be non-adherent, meaning they're less likely to take their oral endocrine therapy, usually tamoxifen. Uh, you can see this here from, this is Don Hirschman's graph, but we showed it um, a decade before that the youngest were the most non-adherent and, and African-American women in the U.S. were. So we've been looking into that and we've come up with, you know, why are people less adherent in big population-based and database studies? It appears that non-white race, lower education, lower income, whether people get radiation or not, associated with non-persistence and non-adherence, um, experience or fear of side effects, feeling less informed, negative emotions about endocrine therapy are also associated with non-adherence. And that leads us to the big area that we know is associated with non-adherence, which is fertility concerns. Many young women, and this is obviously something that's unique to our youngest patients, um, we and others have shown that young women are very interested in their fertility at diagnosis. This was from our original uh, study where we surveyed women through the Young Survival Coalition and showed that nearly 60% reported concern about fertility at diagnosis and almost 30% said that their fertility concerns had influenced their treatment decisions. And that included not taking chemo, coming off hormones early, or not starting them. We've shown in our prospective cohort that this is a continues to be a problem. Um, at baseline, there were about 40% of women and it continues in their survivorship, although it does come down, uh, but doesn't go to zero. Women are still interested. And so we need to attend to this issue, help women to figure out a way to have their families and at the same time, get the best, best breast cancer care that they can. And this can often be very tricky. First, you have to think about it and assess it with the patient talk to them about banking eggs, embryos, taking ovarian suppression through chemotherapy if they need chemotherapy. We obviously don't think the hormonal therapies cause infertility, but it's the time it takes. Uh, and that can be hard both medically as well as emotionally. Uh, we know that ovarian function suppression with LHRH analogs can prevent premature menopause and can end up with more babies born. Uh, the post-treatment pregnancy rate is still pretty modest in these studies, as you can see from Lambertini's meta-analysis. Uh, and nobody un over 40 seemed to have a baby, but um, it didn't appear to have a smidge of safety uh, concern. And so we do encourage this as an option for preservation of menses and potentially fertility. Um, we've looked at the pregnancies in our youngest patients and our young women's cohort. Uh, and uh, we showed that in a median follow-up of five years, there were 173 pregnancies among 117 women. The majority of these were in patients with ER negative disease. That's not a surprise, right? Because the women with their ER positive disease were still taking their tamoxifen or their ovarian function suppression or aromatase inhibitor. And in order to deal with that conundrum for patients, we have been running the positive trial now. Um, that's a study where we look at the pregnancy outcome and safety of interrupting endocrine therapy uh, within 18 to 30 months uh, after completing some of the endocrine therapy. We, um, we have been following these women now and we'll be watching them for disease outcomes, reproductive outcomes, and psychosocial outcomes. We enrolled 506 women as of December 2019, and we're very optimistic that we'll have these data available for patients 
in the coming year. So stay tuned. Hopefully we will have information to inform, is it safe enough to take a break from endocrine therapy and then get back on, recognizing that the risk of recurrence in hormone sensitive breast cancer lasts sometimes for decades. What about local therapy in our youngest patients? How do we think about this and how can we make this better for women? Well, we know that um, when we've looked at the risk of recurrence and subtype that rel local recurrence and regional recurrence were relatively low and improved over time in a large Netherlands cancer registry. It's with modern data for our, their youngest patients, a thousand patients under 35, um, which is great. Um, they showed that it varied by tumor subtype in the women, um, but it didn't vary by receipt of mastectomy or lumpectomy. So our surgeons are good and margins and paying attention to that and getting radiation is good. So one shouldn't have a mastectomy if they don't need it in order to optimize risk of local regional or uh, regional recurrence. What we also know is that we looked at this in um, the young women's cohort and others have looked at this in larger cohorts, including older women, is that um, we have a, a basically an epidemic of bilateral mastectomies going on here in the United States. In our young women's cohort, um, 375 of the 826 eligible women had had bilateral mastectomy. The vast majority had unilateral disease. There were only 20 cases of bilateral breast cancer in the whole cohort. And we followed them out five years to see how they were doing. And what we showed is that physically, this is the bilateral cohort with these triangles, I mean, excuse me, the diamonds, the yellow triangles are the unilateral and the circles are the breast conservation. And you can see physically they're all doing okay. But if you look at the body image subscale and you look at the sexual subscale, the higher score is worse. Uh, the people who had bilateral mastectomies have worse body image even going out five years. This is also true and more statistically significant for those uh, for the sexual subscale for those with bilateral mastectomy. Um, you can see here from a body image standpoint, the women who are doing the worst are those who have bilateral mastectomy and no recon, um, which is not a large proportion, but some women did. And this is also true in year one and year five. And as far as sexual health, same thing. The women doing the worst had bilateral with no recon. So recon does seem to mitigate this to some degree. Anxiety and depression by surgical type. Depression, not so bad, although... The um, bilaterals seem to be a little higher, but not statistically significant, but anxiety definitely higher at year one and still high at year five compared to the other two groups. Um, so a lot of women are doing bilateral mastectomy for peace of mind, but it doesn't seem to be giving them that much peace of mind, unfortunately. So what can we do to help these women? Well, I think it's important that we explain these data to them, that colleagues are developing decision support tools to help women to hear this and support them along the way. Uh, we want them to choose their surgery wisely. And then of course, if they do choose or need to have bilateral mastectomy, we want to encourage reconstruction. Um, obviously if someone has a BRCA1 or 2 or one of those other um, predisposing genes, it's reasonable to do it for prevention as well. Um, we want to advise and support women regarding the risks of weight gain and inactivity through treatment, diet and exercise through and beyond treatment because what they do to their chest isn't the only thing that impacts on their body image and their sexual health. And then of course, um, get our therapists involved to help with therapeutics like behavioral therapy, couples therapy and others, because it takes two to tango. Um, so just in conclusion, you know, in 2005, we realized that we were learning a lot, but we weren't even that good in our clinic at putting, um, putting our money where our mouths were in terms of supporting our patients. And we weren't always so good at making sure our patients got the latest and greatest around some of these softer things. So we started a program for young women with breast cancer aiming to bring up at the forefront fertility, genetics, the psychosocial concerns, the survivorship concerns. I'm proud to say we've served over 7,000 young women to date and we've expanded our services to satellites and network affiliates in our uh, region. And then we've also developed virtual versions that um, we've tested in North America and then others have developed versions around the country and around the world. I know you guys are doing that. This is the latest website um, that we just did. We did a nice upgrade to this. This is Young and Strong. If you Google Dana Farber Young and Strong, you will get this. Lots of nice information on this. Um, and we have lots of topical things like treatment, symptom management. There's a whole section on fertility, survivorship, area for caregivers. We now have developed a web based portal that we're testing um, to try and help our young women to navigate their survivorship and their ongoing 
uh, care needs and it, they get a text message prompt and they fill out assessments on how they're feeling and then they get information to manage any of the symptoms, including anxiety or other problems they may be having. Um, obviously with the strong caveat to call your doctor if anything's not manageable. So in summary, I think young breast cancer survivors have unique and complex psychosocial needs as well as medical needs. And it's really critical if you think about the physical we have to deal with for them, but then the family, the existential, the ethical, they're, they're talking about having babies at risk for recurrence, psychosocial and developmental, because some of them are like children themselves and you have to deal with the parents. A multidisciplinary approach is key to optimal care. Um, and there are a number of issues that pose both challenges and opportunities to improve their care. I hope that by addressing not only potential differences in tumor and host biology, but also behavioral issues and psychosocial concerns that will be able to improve both their psychosocial and their related disease outcomes. And I do believe that improved understanding and improvement of tailored care and support of this vulnerable population is necessary in order for them to be as healthy as possible in the long run. So thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Dr. Ayn. It was a perfect lecture. And uh, I, we sure have lots of questions. And then we have two clinical cases. But uh, a plateia pode mandar as perguntas que a gente vai fazer para ela, se alguém tiver. E a gente vai é, começando por aqui. Dr. Ayn, uh, you showed in your presentation that the young woman with luminal breast cancer has um, uh, worse prognosis than the older woman. So how does this interfere in your clinical practice to, to decide uh, on adjuvant treatment? Because uh, these young women are underrepresented in the clinical studies. Yeah, I think it's a really good question. It is very hard. I, I think that, you know, what I think I hopefully I've shown you is that there's probably multiple reasons why we're seeing that. And it may be that a luminal A type breast cancer just biologically may be different in a younger woman. It may be not, as, it may be more aggressive based on, you know, tumor genomics or, you know, obviously size and lymph node status and stage, but, you know, there may, and we do see that when oncotypes are sent and looked at by age, young women tend to have a higher shift towards higher oncotype than older women. And you got to think that if they're sending it, they were going to potentially use it to impact treatment. So, so the biology of the tumors tends to be a little more aggressive, even in the wimpier subgroup. That's number one. And we've seen some genomics to look at that. The second important factor is, um, you know, if we're going to treat women and not give them chemotherapy, because we don't think it's going to help in some settings, we still don't want to be nihilistic and we need to help to support them so that they can take their endocrine therapy. And we know that they're less likely to take their endocrine therapy, which may be contributing in part to their more poor prognosis. And that's not to blame the victim. It's more to say, how can, you know, you don't want to give someone chemotherapy if it wouldn't add value, or if you could do the same thing with endocrine therapy or better with endocrine therapy, but you've got to be able to get it into them. And so it brings up even ethical concerns of what if the person, you know, because of the nature of endocrine therapy, a five-year program, what if, you know, we've shown in prior, like old studies that ovarian suppression was the same as a course of CMF for women, right? But that's over in six months. So, uh, you know, for some women, maybe we should just give them the CMF and not the ovarian suppression. But of course we don't do that because that would be a little dishonest, wouldn't it? And so it's, it's very tricky how we help to support women, be honest with them and say, look, you know, we don't want to give you chemo, but you got to take your endocrine therapy, but then women come back a year later and they're, they're suffering and they don't want to do it anymore. So it's, it's really challenging. Well, and hopefully so. we'll find new targets and new ways to get at it that are less toxic or better ways to support women. Yes, hope so. So we had two questions for the, from the audience. Romualdo Barroso. Uh, uh, the, his question is about the use of immunotherapy in this population eligible for Keynote 522. Uh, how have you been balancing the discussion with patients about the benefits seen in the trial and the increase of toxicity and no definitive safety data about fertility and other, other long lasting adverse events like adrenal insufficiency? So that is a terrific question. 
And it really is the one that's racking all of our brains and all of our practices today. Um, I would say that in you know a node positive, triple negative, the risks far outweigh the benefit. I mean, excuse me, the benefits seem to far outweigh the risks, and we're giving the immunotherapy and and hoping they don't have anything bad and and worrying enough about them. I think it gets trickier when you have a you know pre-op T two ish, and you know you could just you could have a PCR with ACT alone, and so do you really need the Pembro? Do you really, uh, you know, it's it's tricky. I don't think we know the right answer. So in someone who is particularly worried about their fertility, uh, you would ask, you would have them bank eggs or embryos if you could do that, um, if you still want to give them. I mean, you, you know, it depends on their age also, um, but we really have don't have an answer to that. We want the companies and some ancillary studies to look at the risk of premature menopause at a minimum, let alone fertility, after the IO therapies, we don't have any data about Pembro, I mean, excuse me, about Abema and fertility. We have nothing about Olymp Olaparib and fertility, the PARP inhibitors. And of course, we're using all of these things now as adjunct, and we really don't know the answer. So it's a, it's a delicate conversation. And usually in high enough risk women, they'll either bank and, or they'll just let the chips where it, fall where they may and take the therapy. I think when the situation is borderline, you know, a T 2.1 centimeter triple negative in a person who's really invested in her fertility, you might not give her the Pembro. You might just, you know, and we've had conversations or you might start it if they're not already having a great response to the AC, you know, kind of like sometimes we don't always give them the, the carbo if they're having a beautiful response in a smaller tumor. That's nice. And we have another question for Carolina. In your clinical practice, luminal breast cancer, high risk, in young patients, do you use endocrine therapy for 10 years? I think she's referring to tamoxifen for 10 years or ovarian suppression plus endocrine therapy. Yeah, so another fantastic question. Um, we don't know the right answer. We actually just had a thought piece in the Journal of Oncology Practice about this. And what we've been doing, we actually looked at our young women's data as well, and we're trying to get that published. And what we've been doing and what a lot of our colleagues have been doing is you know, now we're coming up on five years for our soft and text patients, right? Because the data first came out about soft and text in 2016. So all of a sudden in 2021, five years later, there are all these people who have had gotten five years of ovarian function suppression with either AI or tamoxifen. What do we do if we want to continue to extend their endocrine therapy? And the answer is it's kind of a data-free zone in women who are still premenopausal. If they're postmenopausal, obviously you'll give them an AI and you might go 10 years, or you might go seven years, depending on their level of risk. If they're premenopausal still, which many of our young patients still are, and you don't want to take them off the OS unless you're ready to, there's no right answer. We, the only data we have for women who stay premenopausal is from the ATLAS trial and the ADAM trial, which still hasn't been published of that second five years of tamoxifen. And so what I've typically been doing is offering women, you can stay on your OS if you're happy on it, or we can switch you to tamoxifen and let your ovaries come back. And at least the tamoxifen will block their estrogen. And most women have been taking me up on switching because they want to get off the ovarian suppression. Uh, we are actually designing a trial and we're calling it the EOS trial, extended ovarian suppression. And it's going to try to randomize women in that second five years to tamoxifen only or ovarian function suppression with the partner of choice, either tamoxifen or AI, because we don't know this answer. And we'll have to have a worldwide participation in that trial to have it answered. So if we open it, please open it. <laughs> please be a partner. Okay, Pedro. Hi, Anne. Hi, guys. Thank you for the invitation. Nice to see you and again and learn from you again. So I really like the data that you show that uh, the difference biology of the disease that uh, you for you can cor the correlation between age, BRCA, and the different uh, ERPR and HER2 expression. So I I have one question that I sometimes we see the patient that already came with the BRCA test. So do you have any data of the correlation between BRCA and oncotype score? Uh, is there any difference between these kind of patients? 
So I don't have that myself, although we could look at that in our data set. We have not looked at that directly. It's a good question. Um, if you want to look, let me know. Um, but we collaborate, right? Uh, but uh, I do believe that the BRCA mutation carriers are similar to our younger patients seem to have higher risk, um, you know, with ER positive disease seem to have higher genomic um, expression predictor tests. So they, they're also a little bit shifted is my understanding. There are data about BRCA carriers and their, uh, and their recurrence scores, at least. And my understanding is they're also shifted towards the higher um, when the oncotype has been sent. But we haven't looked in our cohort. We probably have it, so we should talk later. Okay, I will look. Lou? There's one more question then from the audience. It's from Felipe Zervis from Porto Alegre. And actually it's a clinical case. Uh, it's a patient with 36 years and she had no mutation, no pathogenic mutation. And she did a breast conservative surgery followed by radiotherapy and chemo. And she stopped her menses while she wasn't on chemo. And after three years of tamoxifen, uh, it was suggested to switch to an astrozole. She didn't get her menses back as I imagine. So in her third month after an astrozole, she started having menses again and her ultrasound showed a uh, endometrial um, growing. So she did a hysteroscopy with biopsy and she just had a, a proliferative um, endometrium. So her exams showed a estradiol that was five and uh, if it's age above 80. And he was just asking, how do you follow these patients? If you usually uh, follow them like every three months with some hormonal uh, levels, checking the levels or how do you do it? Or if you do the switch, you usually do the ovary suppression. So that was the question. Yeah, it's a it's a great question, and we're seeing more and more of this now that we have we're using ovarian suppression so much more. Um, so so typically, even from the get go, I even when I'm trying to suppress people with ovarian function suppression with Lupron or one of the other GnRH analogs, I will check the um, check the hormones every three to six months to make sure they're they're sensibly suppressed. Um, but sometimes they don't suppress. I don't quite understand why. We'll manipulate the, the ovarian function suppression medication and they still don't suppress. We'll make it more common. We'll move it to every three months. We raise the dose. Uh, sometimes they just don't suppress. Um, it's rare, but it happens. Uh, and then the issue about ovaries waking up when you switch someone on to an aromatase inhibitor, um, that's been pretty well documented. There's actually a paper that I was, uh, a study that I participated in called the Appel or Apple trial that Lynn Henry at Michigan ran. It's published in the Annals of Oncology in the 20, 2015, I think, if you look up Nora Lynn Henry. Um, and they had an algorithm for how to follow people that you're switching. Um, your person though, looks like they are suppressed based on their estradiol and their FSH. And they're just having some dysfunctional postmenopausal bleeding. So with a negative biopsy, um, right? That estradiol five is postmenopausal, correct? Is that postmenopausal for you guys? Because ours is less than ten. Um, yes. Station in the eighties. So that to me looks like they're probably just having some dysfunctional postmenopausal bleeding, and they should just make sure there's no malignancy there. But you can see that, and then I'd probably keep her on the AI and follow her for a little while because you certainly want to give that person tamoxifen. Right, especially if you're any bit worried about their endometrium, um, but you could watch her. I mean, you could add the Lupron back, but you're not going to. Her FSH is already, you know, postmenopausal, and estradiol is already low, so I'm not sure how you're going to help her with that. But it's, it's very tricky. The other thing we're seeing a lot of is people who went on it OS for a couple of years, you know, three to five years. They're trying to come off, or they want to have a baby, and then they come off of it, and then their ovaries aren't waking up for a long time. You know, I've seen people a year later and their FSH is still about five. So they're still seeing the effects of the FSH. So their estradiol is low, the FSH is low, 
and you're like, why am their ovaries woken up? And, and it's, it's taking some people a long time. People that didn't get chemo, you wouldn't expect them to be going through menopause. It sticks with them. I don't, I don't know. I'm sure they have normal person data about it, but it seems anecdotally to be happening more than we realized. Uh, thanks a lot. We we are going now to discuss the clinical cases, and we sure uh, have lots of questions and discuss a little bit more about this this, this definition of uh, menopausal status. That is the the hardest thing to do to begin uh, endocrine therapy. Tá vendo, Lu? Uh, yes. Yes. Okay. So we have two clinical cases. The first is a 29-year-old premenopausal woman, nulliparous, engaged, recently graduated from medical school, no comorbidities, body mass index of 24, no family history of cancer. In October 2021, patient felt a lump in her right breast. The MRI revealed a lesion measuring 2.8 centimeters in the largest diameter, irregularly shaped, and it's suspicions. She did a core biopsy that revealed invasive ductal carcinoma with mucinous compound grade two, absence of perineural or lymphovascular invasion. And there was, there was no in situ component. The immunohistochemistry revealed estrogen receptor 95%, progesterone receptor 60, HER2 was zero, KI 67, 40%. The stage, the clinical stage was 2A. So uh, in, this, uh, in this scenario, um, do you consider upfront surgery or new adjuvant treatment? We will begin with Pedro. Uh, thank you. Uh, and I mean, I would talk to the surgeon, to the breast surgeon, if uh, it's, a, it's already a possibility to do a conservative surgery. Uh, if if it, it's okay and I'm, I really see that there is nothing in the, in the axilla, I, I, I'm okay with a firm surgery. Uh, if, uh, if there is no, no chance of uh, conservative surgery, so I would think about new adjuvant treatment, or, or if there is any suspicious of axial involvement, I would try to do new adjuvant treatment to try to save the axilla. But with this information, I am okay with from surgery. Okay, and uh, Ana Amelia, if you want to do your opinion, I my video is open. Okay, I, I agree. I think that upfront surgery is a good uh, option. Uh, if we don't see no signs of uh, nodal involvement and uh, think about uh, free the axilla, and I, I agree, I, I agree with Pedro. I go with upfront surgery in this scenario. Okay. And but I, 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 sorry, sorry, Danny. Oh, but I, I think I, I believe that this patient is not going to, to do not receive chemo anyway. So it's just a question of time of, of chemo. But I, I believe chemo is going to be uh, the, the best option for her. Dr. Ann, um, do you agree with upfront surgery? I completely agree with upfront surgery. I think it's really challenging, though, the fact that we don't have an upfront hormonal therapy option for our younger patients the way we do. If this woman, if it were 69, or 62, you'd look at this and you'd, you'd offer her new adjuvant endocrine therapy uh, and see how it goes. Most likely you might send an oncotype or not, or, or some other genomic expression predictor. Um, I wish we had a better understanding of how to treat the hormone sensitive patients more aggressively with ovarian function suppression up front. But so far um, we don't have a good comparative data for that. So I agree with Pedro. She's going to end up with chemo, most likely with that key 67. In our place, she'd probably get an oncotype instead. We wouldn't even have key 67 as her main or initial pathology um, to help drive it, but we'd probably get, get um, 
surgery first if she's operable so we could see the extent of disease because if she has multiple nodes involved we're not even gonna you know we're not gonna send an oncotype unless she's really anti okay perfect and uh, would you consider bilateral mastectomy in this young woman without a genetic genetic testing i think this is important because as you show in your presentation the quality of life and the the things about sexuality are lower when they got bilateral mastectomy. Yeah, somebody else should answer that. <laughs> okay. Uh, Anna, do you want to begin? I think that it's something to consider because uh, here sometimes we uh, don't have the, the BRCA test, the, the, the genetic test so quickly uh, to, to help us to decide. Uh, and uh, sometimes uh, the, the patient uh, wants to, to do a, a bilateral mastectomy, a, a, a contralateral uh, a mastectomy for re risk reduction. And sometimes uh, the patient uh, talks to you about doing this procedure uh, even without the, the genetic test. So uh, we see that uh, it's a question that is frequent in the, the, our clinical practice. And sometimes even without the test, patients uh, talk to the, the mastologist and undergo this procedure, uh, even if we don't, uh, don't know if it's, uh, uh, think that we will not be a, a, a risk reduction or impact in, in survival with this. Perfect. So I think we have to be very carefully very careful, as Anne showed in her presentation, with this young woman deciding about bilateral mastectomies, uh, especially if they don't have a genetic testing showing a pathogenic mutation, and we don't really know if the risk to a contralateral uh, new breast cancer, it's, it's very high just because she had in a young age. So I think if she can do a breast conservative surgery at this point, it, it might be the best choice to do the surgery. And then in a second moment, after the patient has the, the testing, it's it's a different reality, right? And because yeah. you have, for all patients, you always have this information upfront. Uh, sometimes in Brazil, we have, sometimes we don't have, but I think we should talk with patients about uh, the, the adverse events related to mastectomies, bilateral mastectomies and impact and all of this. And this is definitely something that she can uh, decide uh, later and, and, then, and then do the surgery, uh, the bilateral surgery after. Yeah, I always, I'm oh, sorry, I the woman that you can't put a breast back on, but it's so challenging because people just want to get it done. Right? They don't want to have to go back to the operating room more than they have to. And I, it's just such a hard, hard thing for women. I totally understand why people just want it off. <laughs> yes. Not, not to, but you understand why. And uh, the data shows that it's, this practice is increasing huh, over the last 10 years. Uh, even without the test, women arguing to do the, 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 the bilateral mastectomy, it's a challenge for us because we know that it's no, no data of, of, of uh, uh, benefit, but uh, the, the risk of contralateral breast cancer in a patient who has, has had a, a previous cancer, it's 1% uh, per year. And, uh, and if you if you see, uh, for example, this patient with 29 years uh, uh, along uh, this this life, it's not uh, it's, it's something that we have to consider. Also, have to consider, huh? and the anxi anxiety that it it will bring to the patient. Sometimes we have to put it, it on the table too. Yeah, I think that's what I was trying to say. We have not looked at this yet, but in our young women's cohort, we will be able to look at the risk of a contralateral primary in people who, who are known to not have a genetic predisposition because the data you just quoted includes women 
who have a BRCA1 and 2 mutation. It's a pot, you know, and that in young people is actually a, you know, 10%. And then if you add in the other genes, it's up to 24 or 5%. So if we take yeah. those out, it, the risks may be even lower for a person than it likely is lower for a person who doesn't have a hereditary predisposition. It doesn't mean no risk, but it would be nice to get better risk estimates. Yes. Okay. Yes. And Leandro is asking in your reality in uh, Dana Farber, how long until the results of genetic testings are are out? Uh, when a patient go to upfront surgery? Yeah, it's a really good question. They're usually back long before we can get them into the OR. And that is a problem <laughs> that <laughs> it's a good thing that we can get the genetics done quickly. We often, especially around the time of COVID, have trouble getting people into the OR. And especially if people want bilateral mastectomy, our plastic surgeons book out for several months and so we have a big issue with that and in, in, in uh, you know the busy cities in Boston, I know. And so it's actually, you know, we would normally do breast conservation with this woman as well. And if she were a candidate for breast conservation, then she could get in in a couple of weeks, but we'd still get her genetics back. It's usually about two weeks. But if she weren't a candidate for breast conservation, then that might turn our hands on whether or not to do preoperative therapy if she was going to get chemo anyway, which is interesting. We'd like to know all the data, but sometimes, you know, if you're going to give her dose dense ACT anyway, then we might do it up front just because of the time it would take to get her into the OR. Um, very good. That's very good. I, I think I will continue because of the time. So the patient came to me, she had already had the a bilateral subcutaneous mastectomy plus sentinel biopsy. And the tumor was larger. It was 3.5 centimeter invasive ductal carcinoma with areas of mucins, 20%, presence of interductal component, lymphovascular and perineural invasion, and the nodes were negative. The immunohistochemistry was similar to the biopsy. So, in this case, do you consider gene expression profiling test for the you you uh, for the decision of adjuvant chemotherapy? If you consider what test would you choose? So I think we can begin uh, with Pedro. Okay, so uh, I am quite afraid for these very 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 young ladies that. Uh, to, to do any kind of genetic genomic testing. So <laughs> as Anne just showed us, uh, they are very uh, not represented in this trial. So if you go to the MIND Act, it's less than 5%, under 35. If you go to, uh, to the Taylor Act, it's the same uh, ratio. So uh, I don't think, I don't feel comfortable. I don't think the, these studies are, are powered for this subpopulation. So uh, for under 35, I'm not very comfortable with, with the oncotype or with the MAMA print, any, any of, the, of the genomic signatures. Oh, and Dr. N, uh, in this case, uh, you, you answered uh, before that you ordered the oncotype to, to know better the biology of the disease. In this case, uh, do you consider in these young patients? So I would think about it with her. I think, you know, this is a kind of a mixed, you know, it's a big tumor. It's got lymphovascular invasion. I would, it's pretty ER positive, but not as PR positive with that high K67. So I'd probably send it, but I would be surprised if it was low enough to not want to give her chemotherapy. If she's chemo averse, I'd be okay with it. She'd obviously get ovarian suppression. She certainly fits criteria for Taylor X if she were to come out with a low risk score, but I don't think she's going to have a low risk score. So, you know, I'd have that conversation with her. We might send it anyway, but I think she's going to end up with chemotherapy. Um, you know, even T you know, if she has a very high score, I might give her ACT or, you know, but I'd be happy to give her TC and not check it. Um, so we'd have a discussion about it. I find in our, in our practice, people want it um, while they're healing from their surgery, we'll send it off. But, but oftentimes, um, sometimes they get chemotherapy anyway. Great. 
So we continue. Uh, we, I ordered, uh, you know, contact just to, because uh, she was afraid of chemo. She doesn't, she didn't want to receive without proof that she needed. So I ordered and she, uh, the Oncotype review a recurrency score of 46. It was a high recurrency score. So with this test, um, what scheme of adjuvant chemotherapy uh, or endocrine therapy? Uh, Anna, what test, what uh, scheme of adjuvant chemotherapy do you, do you use for this patient? I think that I'll be comfortable to offer TC six cycles because it's not ne really no negative. And I think in this population high risk with no negative patients, we are, uh, we have ABC trial, plan B trial that make us comfort uh, in uh, take out the antracycline. So I would do TC six cycles. Lou, do you want to comment? Luciana? Dani, I think for this patient, I probably would offer ACT, those dance for her. But I think I agree with Anna. This is something to, to consider uh, also, uh, TC times six. Um, I just have a question to Anne. If this patient uh, comes to you, but it's a triple negative patient, in the scenario of the study, the, the or Chinese study that they did test uh, platin plus taxol, would you offer platin um, instead of ACT? Because they were similar results in this triple yeah. negative court. Thinking about not offering cyclophosphamide to this patient. So we haven't gotten there yet. So the short answer is no. I'd probably get I'd probably give her dose dense ACT if it were triple negative. I, and I'd also offer her that in the you know ER positive setting with that oncotype. We typically only do four cycles of TC. We haven't bought into the six cycles of TC just because every time we've looked at four versus six for you know four of AC versus six of AC, four was no a, six was no better than four. Same thing with taxol. So we tend to do four cycles if we're going to do TC. And if we're going to do a more aggressive regimen, we'll do an anthracycline containing regimen. But that's what I would typically do. Pedro, do you have a question? No, I have one thing to say that what really make me a little bit uh, afraid of this disease, it's the, it's the, the RS, the, 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 it's an oncotype which is high. And we know that the, the, the signature is much more prognostic than, than predictive. So uh, if you believe that it's a very it's a it's a high risk enough to make TC times six and with this oncotype, I would think about ACT. Okay. Even okay. with node negative. Yeah. Yeah. This is a discussion. We don't have the this answer. So uh, before starting systemic treatment, uh, I, we change a little bit of the subject. Uh, in your clinical practice, do you consider some type of fertilization preservation? The patient is only 29, and like OSTE, cryopreservation, or LH, RH agonist, or both techniques. And someone want to begin, or I will point. <laughs> Anna, do you want to begin? I think that uh, with this age, 29, it, we are uh, we have to discuss this with the patients. A very important discussion to have, and I tend to offer both techniques: uh, uh, some uh, cryopreservation technique uh, because it's the 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 standard uh, uh, to reach. Um, pregnancy after the chemotherapy, but uh, I think that uh, we can offer also uh, the uh, agonist, LHGH agonist, because uh, uh, thinking about uh, the return of the hismes, so I, I associate both techniques. I tend to associate both techniques. Dr. N, 
do you use a lot uh, these agonists uh, like Zoladex to prevent uh, menopause in your patients, Dr. N? So I do, and I also think it's, it's useful to use it in the ER positive patients to get their treatment going, especially the ones that wanna have babies sooner rather than later. In the positive trial, we count from when they start the ovarian suppression, even if they got it through chemotherapy. So if she wanted to have her baby sooner, I definitely put her on the LHRH agonist and hopefully positive will show good results, positive results. Um, but the I do do a lot of the LHRH through chemo. Sometimes people don't want the extra side effects through chemo, but many people think they tolerate the hormones better later if they got the LHRH through chemo. Um, mm-hmm. In terms of oocyte cryopreservation, it doesn't tend to last that, it take that long. So I will do that while the person's healing. You know, a 29 year old though, doesn't have a high risk of going into menopause from treatment. Um, so it's not the end of the world if she can't afford to do the oocyte or embryo cryopreservation. Um, so I'll, I'll do both for the person that's very engaged, but I reassure the person that either can't or doesn't want to do it or is anxious about it, that if you are not able to do it, it's certainly something that is, you know, regular chemo, dose sense ACT or four cycles of TC. We have good data now. It's not likely to send them into menopause under age 30. Um, and certainly, you know, as they get older, that becomes more likely. So she's in a good, she's in good shape if she needs to not do any of that stuff. That's perfect. So we did the, the uh, fertility preservation, uh, or the cryo preservation with 16 eggs. Um, and after treatment for a uh, contraception, uh, we, I want uh, to discuss this in your clinical practice, Pedro. Uh, what do you recommend for this patient? Because she's young and she, going to, she, she, she can't uh, become pregnant. So I would send her to the gynecologist and we try to uh, always uh, we try to always to to use the intrauterine dispositive IDU with no hormonal uh, flow. So it's it's the best way to for contraception for in this beginning, in my opinion. Okay. So um, uh, I offer TC for her six cycles with mild adverse effects. This is my clinical case, so I can change. The, the truth <laughs> is that I didn't offer anthracycline. I agree. <laughs> so uh, what would be your choice of adjuvant endocrine therapy? Um, I, I, I think we want to discuss now. She's a right risk patient. Um, I, I think Dr. N, if you can answer. And can I just, Danny, Danny can I just uh, add a question? Yes. Uh, do you have any concerns about doing uh, oocyte cryopreservation protocol for a patient that would do new adjuvant chemotherapy in a luminal disease? Every other time we have a tumor board discussion about this, like if, if a patient uh, has nodal disease and uh, she's a luminal B and she's going to go under uh, new adjuvant chemo. Would you have concerns about that, about the protocol for the, the whole site? Yeah, so I think that's a great question. There are actually some data from, I believe, Stanford, where they looked at the time it took, and it only took about three weeks for people to get stimulated before they started um, their chemo, and there was no clear safety signal. So of course I worry a little bit, but we we know in people who have had their surgery and are at risk for recurrence, and we have some you know timing data for the people getting it preoperatively. And I think there was were some short term outcome data that were not negative. Um, generally, is in a very um, engaged person, I support them doing it, but only one cycle and no delays. <laughs> you know, just kind of going. only one cycle. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Okay, and so what's the choice of adjuvant endocrine treatment for Dr. Ann? For me to start? So, you know, yes. this person we decided was high enough risk to give chemo to, so you definitely follow soft and text and wanna give her uh, ovarian function suppression. And then, you know, whether you start her on an aromatase inhibitor or tamoxifen or many different, people make different choices, uh, 
practitioners, I tend to start with AI in a person who had enough risk to get chemotherapy and is that young. I'm impressed with the exomestane data um, from text and soft. Uh, but if they don't tolerate it, I don't feel badly about switching. Usually I try and get them two to three years of the AI if I if they're like tolerating it, but not not that well. And then I'll switch them kind of like the switch trials in the postmenopausal setting. But I try and do OS with an AI up front, again, unless tamoxifen is needed. You know, if the lower risk situation, I might use tamoxifen, but she's um, got high enough risk to get all that chemo. So I'd want to suppress her and do AI. And there is a question for the audience. How, how low do you consider the estrogen receptor positive? Like the question is, if you offer endocrine treatment for a patient with estrogen receptor less than 10%. And I think, um, Pedro, do you, do you want to answer? Uh, yes, uh, I don't have this knowledge, but I sometimes I try to to one, like one cycle, uh, which it takes like a, around twenty to thirty days, and then I talk to the patients first, and then after we decide to do the chemo after this one one trial, one try. Okay, and let me continue. So uh, in a patient with uh, ovarian suppression and aromatized inhibitor, this young woman, uh, do you check estradiol levels um, uh, routinely? Uh, Anna, do you want to, to answer? I check, I check uh, for the, for periodically in the uh, first uh, 12 months, uh, three months, uh, uh, since every three months, I check. Uh, I try to check uh, the 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 suppression, see the 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 level of estradiol and FSH. I use to check. Okay. The other question for how how long do you consider endocrine therapy? And uh, this question is because she wants to become pregnant, and all the discussion that we already have. So. Uh, I don't know, I, I would just ask for one person because we have another case. So uh, Lou, do you want to answer this? Sorry, Danny, which was the question? How, long, how question? long do you consider endocrine therapy for this patient? Five years, less? Okay, years. so I think the data we have, it's for five years doing ovarian suppression plus uh, endocrine therapy. It, so some patients with very high risk, sometimes we discuss about doing more tamoxifen, but uh, as Anne showed us, we don't really have this data. It's going to be very good to have this data. And yes, Anne, we would love to participate in this trial. So please consider Brazil and our clinical research okay. centers for, for this study. Uh, but Usually that's what I have been doing. So five years and then for very high risk patients, maybe discussing tamoxifen, but not going further with ovarian suppression for this patient. We don't really have this data. I think uh, Homualdo had a question also, and for IDU with hormones, do you usually, if the patient comes in, with uh, ID with hormones, do you usually recommend to remove it, or how do you deal with this kind of? So it's a great question, and I've kind of evolved in my thinking over the last several years. And we have a review where we looked at the data for the use of IUDs for people on tamoxifen. And if you look at, there's some nice studies. I believe where they were in, one of them was in France. And if you looked. Not only was the IUD, the hormonal IUD safe in women on tamoxifen, meaning no impact on their outcomes, but they had protection from the dysfunctional bleeding and the buildup of their endometrium from the progestin eluding IUD when they were on tamoxifen. So in people where I'm going to treat them with tamoxifen, I'm actually okay with them keeping their Mirena, we call it, or the progestin IUD in. If I'm gonna give them ovarian function suppression and an aromatase inhibitor, 
I usually have them get it out just because they won't need it in the same way. And I'll have them get a copper IUD. They won't be bleeding and, um, you know, because we'll be suppressing them. And it's not, it's not as show, it's not going to protect them from anything except pregnancy. And usually a copper one's okay for that. So that's typically what I've done, but a lower risk situation, getting tamoxifen, I let them keep it in. That's perfect. Very good. The other question then that Louisa had was about a patient's end that had like less than 10% of your yes, receptor. Yes. Uh, if you would offer this patient uh, adjuvant endocrine therapy with ovarian suppression, how do you manage those patients? Because now they are being included in the studies of triple negative disease. And how do you deal with these patients? Yeah, I think it's very hard. I think you bring up a really good point. And it's, you know, the teaching has always been any ER, give them endocrine therapy, but it's kind of torturing people. So in someone like that, I will typically offer them tamoxifen if I don't have confidence that they're going to get much from their hormonal therapy, but I want to, I want them to get something, you know, in a very young person as tolerated. And then I'll have a low threshold for discontinuing it. But I totally agree um, you know, that person usually also got chemo. Some, it depends on the very, you know, the amount of expression, like, a, you know, a strong 10%, then fine, I'll give them tamoxifen. But I usually do not give someone with a low ER, you know, that one to 9% range. I usually will not give that person ovarian suppression unless they had like 20 lymph nodes positive, And I just want to throw every single thing I can at them. Okay. So um, um, she has a great desire to become pregnant. I know that we don't have the results of the study to, to stop endocrine therapy, but in the clinical practice, um, are you stopping the endocrine therapy for the patient to become pregnant? Uh, this is a tricky question. Uh, I don't know if Anna wants to answer. Uh, I tried to complete five years of treatment but uh, if the patient is uh, very, wants to, to get pregnant, uh, you don't have, I, I, I try to, to complete five years, but uh, she had to decide if she wants to get pregnant, we'll continue, uh, we'll allow. I think that's not only our decision. <laughs> Dr. Ann, um, in your clinical practice, the patients that want to become pregnant now, uh, before the, the results of the studies, uh, do you, it's okay to stop after three years of endocrine therapy? Um, well, I would not say it's okay. I would say that we don't have the data, that we, that we conducted a study where we don't have the answer yet. It, you know, and we're never going to be perfectly conclusive. And I, you know, in these situations, I always remind people that just because a pregnancy doesn't increase a risk of recurrence doesn't mean they're not still at risk of recurrence. And so I typically will use the assessment of how high a risk are they more than anything else to tell me how much I want them to get more endocrine therapy in before I support them coming off for a break. And so in a person that had enough you know, risk to warrant aggressive chemotherapy, to warrant ovarian function suppression and AI, I'd probably try in the absence of the, of the, um, of the positive data yet, showing not a whiff of, of problems, which of course I don't know the answer, so there may be some problem, um, I'd probably try and get her to get at least three years under her belt. And I would just be extrapolating from, you know, tamoxifen for a year was 10%, tamoxifen for two years was 30% risk reduction, tamoxifen for five years is 50% risk reduction. So I'd try and get them between the two and the five year mark, which is, I used to land on three years as a compromise. She may not be willing, but I'd be arguing with her. Perfect. So she's on tamoxifen plus Zolodex. She, she was recommended to have a genetic counseling. Uh, today, I talked to her about this and she has a copper intrauterine device. So the other case, thank you, Dr. Anne. Thank you. Obrigada a todos pelas excelentes uh, respostas. Thank you, Danny. Please, can you just go one? Yes, please, no, yeah. So this is a, a 
a 39 year old premenopausal woman with no comorbidities and her, her BMI was 26. From her family history, she had a maternal grandmother with ovarian cancer at 72. On June uh, 18, she felt a lump in her right breast uh, and the ultrasound showed a 2.8 centimeter nodule on her upper quadrant of her right breast and uh, its lateral axillary lymph node. So she did a core biopsy that showed an uh, invasive disease, grade three, with uh, luminal B. And she also did a fine needle uh, biopsy with positive cytology and systemic staging showed negative. No, please, Danny. So this patient, because she had a uh, nodal disease, she did new adjuvant chemotherapy, ACT dose dense. And then uh, one question to discuss, because we have been having some discussions on Toma Bird about this. She did a, a LA, LHRH agonist uh, previously to chemo. And in your practice and when treating with chemo, this premenopausal woman, you said that you would offer LHRH agonist, but do you have a threshold of age? Like if the patient has 43 and is going to do five years of uh, endocrine therapy, would you not offer her uh, LH, LHRH agonist in order to, to try to help her having her menses back? How, it's, how do you do this? How do you manage this in your practice? I usually, unless they're interested in their, and you know, a person who's got this much risk, you're going to, and she's got a BRCA too. So you're going to actually, oh no, it's a VUS. Um, she may lose her ovaries anyway, given the grandma history. Um, you, I wouldn't care about her fertility and you're going to suppress her probably for the next five years at least. So I, I wouldn't be racing to give her the LHRH agonist to preserve anything. Um, if she wants to get going on hormonal therapy, I might give it to her, but typically it's too much going on at the beginning. And so I typically don't start it till later for right or wrong. It's not necessarily the right thing. And text, of course, for people getting chemo, they started it with the chemo and it was clearly safe enough to do that. But, um, but I don't, I don't do it routinely unless someone wants to get started on it. So the threshold would be if the patient desires fertility uh, or discussion about fertility, that pretty would be much. your first? Pretty, okay. pretty much. Yeah, I think so. I think so. That's, I think that's how I make the decisions. Um, you know, we have in wholesale adopted suppressing through chemo. Sometimes I'll do that in a person with a hormone who I'm treating preoperatively with chemotherapy. If they have a big node positive breast cancer and I want to get them everything I can to treat their cancer early. I, you know, if I'm worried about their response, I'll give them the chemo and the ovarian function suppression as kind of twofold treatment, you know, give them OS and, and the chemo at the same time. But, but otherwise it's only if they're interested in their fertility, do I typically start it at the beginning for right or wrong. It may not be the right thing to do, but that's what I do. Pedro, Daniana, how do you manage that? Then you can start. No, mm -hmm. I think uh, it's okay to offer, but um, like Dr. Ann said, she probably became uh, menopause after this chemo. She, she will want to anticipate the menopause. So um, I can offer, but if the insurance doesn't want to pay or something, it's okay. Uh, I try to offer always together with chemo in the first. A cycle, and I, I I try to offer like very very often, not just because of uh, uh, for for pregnancy, but also for uh, ovarian dysfunction, which is associated to worse quality of life. I also try to offer. Perfect. So uh, yeah, I offered her, um, I usually offer 
for those patients. I, I had once a discussion with Lambertini and he's a very uh, enthusiastic of uh, this approach. And I really think that maybe the patient uh, getting her menses back when she's like 44, 45, it, it might be something that improves her quality of life. So, so she did the new advent chemo and she got a great re response and she did a breast conservative surgery and sentinel node biopsy and she had six millimeters residual disease. No lymph nodes in, in the surgery and tumor-free margins. What would be your choice of adjuvant uh, endocrine therapy for this patient? I can talk if you <laughs> please. So, well, I, I really like uh, ovarian suppression for this young patient. So, I always try to offer, but I always offer tam with tamoxifen. So just, I have some like thoughts about this because first of all, it, it's the only scam that really showed uh, survival, overall survival benefit against tamoxifen. Uh, it's also, I feel very comfortable if it's a young lady with, uh, for the escapes of menses. So I don't feel afraid of this escape. Uh, we have any uh, protection for, for the bone also with the tamoxifen. And uh, I always remember that uh, Anne Patrick said that the <laughs> best the best uh, uh, scam is the, the one that the patient really takes. The, it's, and there yeah. is more adherence with the, with the tamoxifen. So I, I always try to do tamoxifen. Do you, even in the highest risk situations, you give tamoxifen first with OS? I try to. I try to. But yeah. when there's a lot of node positive, I feel a little bit afraid, but, uh, and then I try to do the switch, but I always try to do tamoxifen in, in the beginning. You're nicer than me. I start with the hard stuff and then I go back. Me too. Yes, I, <laughs> yes for very me high too. risk patients, I usually do, do that. Start with uh, AI and then if she doesn't tolerate, but this patient, please then in next. This patient, she, she did have a hard time with uh, chemotherapy already. So she started monthly Zolodex with uh, tamoxifen because she really had a hard time doing chemo and she, she probably wouldn't tolerate uh, AI. So, and she was already doing daily exercise and stretching. So she was very, uh, she was starting a diet so next, Danny, please. And most of the adverse events were hot flashes. She, she as I, I said, she had grade one doing chemo and vaginal dryness and insomnia and mood swings. And how would you manage those symptoms that are the most prevalent symptoms during endocrine therapy? I must say we only have like more five minutes more. We are <laughs> passing time, but just last thoughts about this, please. I always try to encourage uh, the patient to do exercise. I think that's the best way to manage all the, uh, the most of the symptoms. Uh, also, of course, I use a medication too uh, uh, as a support in this this transition. But always trying to encourage uh, the patient to uh, uh, add to a, a more um, uh, active active in exercising. This is my goal. Yes, the thing is that she was already doing exercise daily. And so what else would we offer I, her? I use a lot of oxybutynin for hot flashes and the results are quite good. So if it doesn't uh, get better, I think we can use the other antidepressives or anticonvulsivants. But generally, they get better. Edwin and last thoughts. 
So I try to do the same of, of Danny, uh, any kind of venlafaxine or sibutramine. And for the vaginal dryness, I use promestrin, uh, uh, intravaginal promestrin, uh, which make me more another another one <laughs> to talk about the tamoxifen. So I, <laughs> yes, this is something that uh, really makes me motivate to use tamoxifen because we can. Uh, use with a little more uh, confidence the right. estrogen, the intravaginal estrogen. And right. yeah, same, same. Typically, I'll try a you know, venlafaxine and vaginal non hormonal stuff first. Um, yes. And that, you know, I think there's also a little bit of settling out. You know, you try not to have people quit something within the first three months, right? Hopefully they're not miserable and trying to get things under, you know, I find that so many symptoms are conflated in the first couple months. Uh, you just have to kind of get people through that period sometimes and see them often and support them, validate how they're feeling and then it's going to get better. Yes, this is something very important to say. Sometimes just to see patient like once a month, instead of just seeing three months, it's, it makes a difference. So this of is course, something, of it's an important message. And just a last question, Leandro is asking about the usage of ovarian suppression for two years with tamoxifen, followed to tamoxifen. Um, do you usually use this data to offer last time of ovarian su suppression? I mean, shorter course? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, there's there have been shorter courses, ABCSG12, ASHA. I think, you know, I typically try and get people to do five years based on soft, but um, I feel better if they've gotten two to three years. And then sometimes I'll just switch to tamoxifen only. Perfect. So the goal would be five years, but if the patient doesn't tolerate, we have data that uh, allow us to, to feel more comfortable and, and to pass this information to the patient as well, right? And you know, the hard part is that we're never gonna do a study of three versus five years of this. So it is, we don't know that five years is better than three years, right? We just do right. it. Because yes. that's, that's what the recipe was. It's hard, it's hard for, you know, so I try and make patients take something for five years, but yeah, you know, I think that's a lesser evil is if they're miserable especially when it says tamoxifen only after a couple of years. Yes, very, very good. Thank you so much, all of you. Danny, my partner, Pedro, yeah. Ana, Amelia, and, and Patrick. It's, uh, it's an honor to have you here. We are all big fans of your work and yes, all that you have been doing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, it's a pleasure. Always fun to see you guys. Yeah, bye bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Boa noite a todos. Até a próxima. Boa noite.